Le, but we have an amazing panel today. We have an amazing topic to discuss. So welcome everybody. Let's wait just a few minute, more minutes for you to enter. We're right in time with an amazing guest and friend. So we're gonna have fun. Today we're gonna have fun and we're gonna learn a lot. Okay guys, so welcome. I hope you get ready and I hope you get ready to answer a couple of questions. This is gonna be extremely interactive. Okay, we wanna hear about you. We want that chat, you know, asking questions to the panel. We have something very special today because we have a real patient going this entire journey. Okay, we're gonna have him, we're gonna communicate with him. We did some measurements, we're gonna do surgery, we're gonna use Varian, we're gonna use Aura. So we're gonna start, we're right on time. And, you know, welcome to another episode of another webisode, sorry, of Stop at Nothing. What do we want in this kind of episode? We want an online connection with the audience, with an expert panel that you already know who they are, amazing speakers and friends and, you know, surgeons. We're gonna do some hands demonstration today. Today is gonna be hands demonstration on steroids because everything is gonna be about the experience. We want active engagement, for, engagement from you guys and the content is gonna be on demand. What we want here is these three main principles about how we adults learn. And we want deep learning. Today we want critical thinking. We don't want you with a cooking recipe on how to implant a toric IOL, but we want you with critical thinking, okay? To understand the cases, to reason about the cases. Also the environment is gonna be great to learn because then we're surrounded with all the machines, we're gonna do surgery. So everything you're gonna experience when you implant a toric IOL, you're gonna see it right here. And the third thing is this is focused for you guys, okay? So please just comment anything, all the questions you have, please comment them, okay? Uh, this is a, a very interesting slide. I always take a couple of minutes to talk about it. And you know, as in that amazing book, from uh, uh, people from Latin America, you know, it's, it says that, you know, the only secret we have to improve in Latin America is academy and industry working together and, you know, going in the same direction. So today, you know, we're partners with the Alcon Experience Academy and we have Shemaine Labelsky with us and we have a, we want a couple of words with, from you, Shamin. Thank you so much, Evo. Thank you so much for the opportunity to partner with Thelma University. This has been an amazing series. I really want to congratulate you and the team. We have a great panel today. Um, what Thelma University doing is really incredible. Um, I just, I, I know that this is a really hot topic and I really can't wait to hear all the pearls we're going to learn today. Um, I also did want to ask the audience if they have not had a chance to check out the Alcon Experience Academy for them to please do uh, in the search function, for example, they can type in biometry and they're going to have tons of short videos and sessions, Warren Hills on there, Robin Van, um, Dr. McCabe, she also has a module, Evo, I know you have some modules on there, um, theory on IOL formulas, IOL calculation errors. So just a lot of great things that also can add to this. So thank you again, your team at Ophthalmo University is doing incredible things and I really am enjoying this partnership. So thank you again. No, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to work with you guys. Uh, and well, we are gonna start, you know, I just wanna not show any slides. I want you to understand what the panel is gonna look like. This is amazing. My co-host here, Juan Manuel Paulin from Mexico City, I know this amazing surgeon for a couple of years yeah. now. And, you know, he's obsessed with toricity and astigmatism. We can learn so much from him. He has mind algorithms to work about any case. So please stay tuned. Then we have Kathleen from the US. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's, it's an honor, you know, uh, an amazing surgeon from the US. And Fernando Cresta and Cesar Villar from the amazing Brazil, also with a lot of experience in toric IOLs, with a lot of technology. So please, I want you guys to be engaged in the and ask questions, and the panel is going to answer all of them. 
as you know, of Talmud University, fake commenters present in all social media. Uh, we say hi to people watching in Facebook, YouTube, uh, in Instagram. You know, we're live from uh, many, many platforms. So please stay, you know, engaged as well. And, you know, I, I want to present uh, webisode number five for next week. It's going to be great. It's going to be about learning fake of fast and efficiently. We're going to have again, you know, Ricardo Nose from Brazil, Cecilia Torres from Chile, and Ashley Brissett from Canada and you in, living in the U.S., talking about not only learn, you know, basic things about uh, fake homosification, but maybe new things and new technology. What about active century? What about the new fake tip we're gonna have pretty soon, right? So basically all the secrets to learn things very fast. Well, the goal here today, again, as always, is skill and knowledge transfer. This is for you. We want you to leave, you know, this web webisode with the, as much knowledge as possible, but also critical thinking to understand how to reason in Toric IOLs. And we're going to have a patient and, and surgeon journey. That's going to be very, very interesting. And let's go to this, you know, to this slide that is going to talk about the structure of what's going to happen. We're going to talk a lot about what is astigmatism, not only what is astigmatism, but what is astigmatism in your practice when you implant monofocals and when you implant trifocals. We're going to talk about a real case, preoperative, IOLI calculation. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to do some surgery as well. So this is going to be this is going to be one of the main um, slides to talk about. We're also, please, Lisandro. We're going to ask a couple of questions to the audience. And first, I want to ask my co-host. There is so many things we could talk about yes. for hours about that. But what are your first impression, Juan Manuel, about? all those, th th those things you need to take into account in the moment to implant a toric IOL. Okay, first of all, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. What, what, a, uh, what a great panel, what a, what a great group of experts. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ivo. Well, I'm just seeing you later. Of course, the first thing uh, we do when we have a, a, an intracular lens calculation is to look at the astigmatism. Does it has, uh, does this patient have astigmatism? What kind of astigmatism does it have? Does it has? Is it a with the rule astigmatism and against the rule astigmatism? And you start planning just by seeing the calculation, how your surgery is going to be right at that moment. And and for example, a little uh, things uh, start to get to to matter. For example, how uh, how's the construction of the face? The eyes are, are there pop up or or, or it's going to be hard to, to get exactly. access? Where is the main incision going to be located? So I think. What I say when I look about astigmatism is that astigmatism has a name and the last name. Very good. Uh, how's the magnitude? Is it one day after, two day after, three day after? Is it with the rule, against the rule? What's the impact of the posterior caudal astigmatism? Is it that kind of astigmatism? Because it's going to make a huge impact in the decision of the IO that we're going to choose. So I say, the, uh, seeing this slide, the first thing we do when we have an intracular lens calculation is look first at the astigmatism and start planning your surgery. Very good one, very good one. And we also have a, a surprise for Kathleen here. You know, we, as I, almost all, all people know, we in, in Latin America, we do the incision in the forehead of the patient. But maybe in honor for Kathleen, yeah. maybe we're gonna do a temporal FACO. What do you think, Kathleen? And it's great yes, to have you definitely. here. Yes, definitely. What do you think, what yeah. do you think when you see this slide, Kathleen? Yeah, no, I totally agree with going temporally. Um, actually, it has a little bit less effect on astigmatism. So, you know, uh, I applaud your changing to temporal today for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wait, yeah. Any thoughts, any thoughts about this specific slide and what astigmatism is for you? Yeah, so actually, I think astigmatism correction is really foundational to what we do with refractive cataract surgery today. You know, I, it's the first thing I talk to patients about when I'm telling them what their options are with cataract surgery, because really everything else as far as independence and visual quality flows from correction of astigmatism. And many of our patients just don't even understand what it is. So part of the challenge is communicating effectively with the patient that this is something they have. You know, a lot of times they'll say, you know, nobody ever told me I had astigmatism. And I say, well, they didn't say they had, you had myopia and presbyopia either. 
they said you need glasses. So there's a little education that goes on and effective education can help our patients really make the right choice so that they get the kind of visual result they're looking for. So it's, it's important, foundational. Thank you. So clear, so clear concepts and I agree so much. We agree so much that we're gonna communicate with the patient today. We're gonna take a couple of minutes to actually do that. Cesar, already part of the, the family of Palma University. Thank you for being here with us. We know you love Tauricity. When you see this slide, what, what do you think about? Hi, Ivo. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be on this side of the journey at this point. Um, well, I, I totally agree with, with uh, Dr. McCabe. Um, astigmatism is one of the first things I look at when I see a patient, when I think about his cataract surgery. I look at his three, uh, at, at least three scans in my practice. Um, I check for consistency. I check if their astigmatism needs to be controlled during the surgery so I can get an optimum success. And then I talk to the patient whether I'll need to have a toric IOL in or at least a relaxing incision uh, to make sure that the interocular lens we're gonna put in is gonna do the optimum effect and he's gonna have the best um, outcome for distance vision or even near vision if he has first myopia correction too. So yes, uh, absolutely, astigmatism should, uh, is and it should be um, manageable in all cataract surgery for sure. Excellent, excellent, I agree 100%. Um, couple of things, we have also people seen in the other side of the world in the morning from Indonesia, so Noor, great to have you here with us. Thank you for being here with us and being with us early. And we did a couple of questions and it was very interesting. We saw that 40% of the people uh, who are present, they're using uh, toric IOLs to fight astigmatism in cataract surgery. That's very interesting. And almost 95% of them think that, that astigmatism is important. So we're with the correct crowd here, okay? Uh, that's very good. And Fernando, it's a pleasure to have you here too. Fernando Cresta from Brazil, uh, another surgeon that loves astigmatism, so welcome. Hi, hi guys. Well, uh, more than 70% of patients have uh, 0.5 diopters or more of astigmatism. And more than 40% of patients have one diopter or, or more. So corneal astigmatism is very common in our uh, cataract surgery patients. Management of astigmatism, uh, as everybody uh, told, uh, with toric IOLs improve quality of vision, uh, patient satisfaction, and reduce patient's needs of spectacles. The key element uh, here is to recognize the correct magnitude and axis of the corneal astigmatism. For this, uh, it's important to have a good pre-op uh, K readings and toric alignment is also very important. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, we agree 100% and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have a very open discussion here. Again, to everybody, you know, there's a lot of people coming in. So please ask your questions. We're gonna try to move fast with the slides because we want you to, you know, to see what's gonna happen, uh, you know, in the entire journey. One of the important things we did for this, and we have here Lisandro, uh, you know, part of, of the team that took the job to do it, and it's gonna be a great tool for you guys, is to design uh, an astigmatism simulator. Kerry was telling us about how, how we explain, how does the patient understand what astigmatism is? So everybody who wants to have this astigmatism, in their console, they can take a picture to the QR code. And let's see if the video runs here. There you go. And, and it's happening fast, guys. It's happening fast, but you can also understand there, you know, um, about how the patient can understand what the vision is and you, you can switch it, you know, you, you can change the view of one image and the patient will understand how, what astigmatism is. Um, you know, some of the speakers were talking about the, the number of patients with, you know, uh, toric, uh, with astigmatism and they're treatable with toric IOLs. This is a Warren Hill database of more than 6,000 patients. So we understand that, you know, with this distribution that uh, astigmatism is important and is gonna be present in your practice. 
uh, we're going to talk again very fast uh, because I want to end. I, I don't want to talk anymore for tonight. I want the panel to talk. But we're going to talk about the value proposition of using toric IOLs in your practice. We're going to talk about how we, we communicate with patients and why not price? Because here in Latin America and many other parts of the world, the, when we talk about price, that's very, very important. We're going to talk, of course, about planning and IOL calculation, a little bit about surgery. And then in the end, we already have Dr. Velasquez here, a great friend, talking about how then you grab everything and all this data and improve your outcomes. The, and, and here we have an amazing topic. And look at that title and look at this case. So my co-host here is going to tell us something that it's very, very interesting. We also have a couple of questions for the audience. So please, Lisandro, put the second set of questions. Okay. And Juan Manuel, what about this case? Well, I'm seeing your slide here, uh, Ivo, and uh, I don't know if it's actually everybody needs a toric, but you need to see to everybody's astigmatism and take a decision about it. I don't know, for example, if we really need to spend right now, 2020, spend all these minutes in explaining to the patient the importance of astigmatism and correcting it. I think we should not even should do that. That's a good one. You need to correct the astigmatism. And, and this is what you need. And sometimes the patient has astigmatism in one eye, he, he doesn't have it in the other eye. And for example, if the cast moves, it's because you have one different pathology in this eye and another different in the other one. <laughs> so I, this is uh, in. What I say to the patient is, in my experience, this is the best scenario for, for you. And it doesn't matter if you have different plans for each eye. And for example, looking at your slide here, this is uh, astigmatism has a newer importance or their new importance now with multifocal IRL. Because as you know, multifocal IRL requires a very precise surgery and a very precise refractive outcome. And one of the most common uh, refractive errors I've seen in non-satisfied patients with a multifocal IOL is the uh, moving the, the astigmatism of, of the patient from with the rule to an against the rule astigmatism. And this example is the perfect example of the, the patient that is, uh, has the, a very high risk, risk that the, uh, it happens to him. What are we doing here is a, a very uh, small uh, with the rule. Let me see. Uh, it is uh, 40, the steep is as well. Okay, yeah, this is an, an against the rule astigmatism, which you can, uh, if you look at like uh, with no, no, no attention on Very it, fast, you yeah. can see that you can think that it's a, a small astigmatism, just a half of a diopter. But for example, if you're like a Latin American surgeon and you make your incision in the, upper, uh, the superior uh, uh, location and not the temporal location, you're gonna make worse the astigmatism. And if you consider uh, also the impact of the, coster the posterior coronal uh, astigmatism in this patient, you're gonna have that, in, uh, that result, which is a, a, a one diopter astigmatism against the rule astigmatism. And this is gonna be a very uncomfortable patient, uh, mostly if, it has, if he has uh, a multifocal IOL. So the best patient turns into the worst patient when you do the attention <laughs> in the <laughs> axis of the astigmatism. And this is something we, we experience more in, in, in surgeons that we do the, the, the incision, the main incision at the superior uh, location. So if you have this kind of patient with a small amount of astigmatism, and if it is and against the rule, the very first pearl I will give to you is to move fast to a temporal location incision. You're gonna avoid a lot of problems if you, uh, uh, make that small adjustment in your, in your surgery and your outcomes are going to be better. Very good one. And then again, Kerry, in order to you, right? We're, we're talking about interesting things here for Latin America. <laughs> Let's see what the people say. Let's see, because, you know, we, we actually did a tricky question about, we were talking about amount of astigmatism. In the first one, uh, I love it. 80% of people said all of the above. We, we, we put many, many things that you need to take into account and they were all important. This is very good. Uh, and, you know, uh, we're going to talk a lot about that. And we have a 44% of, of, of colleagues, oh, sorry, 
44% of colleagues saying that you need to have more than one diopter. And that case was talking about exactly, exactly something that you need to take into account, right? So I think this was a very, very interesting concept. And for those who put one diopter, I think we need to rechange the way of thinking and, you know, a name and a last name. I love exactly. that a lot. Yes, uh, the, the magnitude and the axis, because it's, it's weird to say that, but it's easier to treat higher or higher astigmatism uh, and it's it's more difficult to, to, to treat a small amount of astigmatism because of the Excellent. effect of the, uh, of the coronal patella. Excellent. And very interesting uh, interaction with the audience. Let's keep in, in the chat, uh, uh, the panel, if you can help me, you know, if there is many questions in the, in the, in the chat, please let me know so we can move fast. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So please, there you go. Uh, and this is good. So this is, I mean, this is very important, guys. We could talk about three or four hours about toricity and astigmatism. That's that's the truth. But we're gonna do, you know, something more general, and we want to talk about main concepts. And then why not in the future do many other uh, webisodes? Uh, for here, for those who who want to go a little deeper, we're gonna do a workshop next week. It's gonna be only for fifty people. So everybody who is interested interested please you know another picture in the qr and you know we can do something and this is my favorite part slides are done let's let's get into the experience because this is this is the you know the secret today so we're yeah. going to have a camera that's going to be moving and we're going to go to the consult okay we're going to go with the patient let's tell me when that camera it's on and we're going to find the patient are you guys seeing me there Yes? Perfect. Okay. So let's come here. Rudolf, we have an amazing patient here. Since we're talking in Spanish, we have a patient from Holland here. What do you think, guys? So please, he's actually a real patient of mine. <laughs> and we brought him, you know, to, to do some measurements and communicate with him about cataracts and touristy. Please, Rudolf. Let's come here. Guys. We, so we have okay, a concept perfect. here. And I want you, I, I want you, we're, we're going to go fast, but there's going to be very interesting thing here is happening. First, we're going to examine the patient. He's already have a dilated pupil, but we did all the measurements. And we're going to talk a lot about this communication. Please, the panel, if you have any comments about how you do this, let me know, because I think this is very important, as Katie said before. If, if you can see here, I have a way to, you know, to teach patients with physical models Evolve. about the eye, about the cataract, about the toric IOL, about where the, the IOL goes, about the real size of the IOL, but also have some videos. We have the people from Rendia, they're amazing friends and we thank them. And look at that. Look, Evo, look at that um, the camera is not pointing so at what you're showing. Me to teach with a, the, 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 the camera's not the, the, the camera's not showing what you're what you're looking at. It, it is. It's a different camera. Just look, scroll down, and you'll see it on a different. Okay, I'm sorry. Yep, no problem. <laughs> okay, so are, are you seeing what I'm showing? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, I got scared, and also <laughs> I have you know uh, we're gonna do a lot of measurements, and we're gonna show what's happening. For example, look at this. We're gonna take dry eye into account. This is very important, right? Dry mm -hmm. eye is gonna be important for the measurement and also, you know, for the quality of vision in, in the future. So with Rudolf, I'm gonna examine him. Let's see if we can see what's going on in the slit lamp. You know, there is a little bit uh, misconnection with the slit lamp and the video, but I probably you are gonna see his cataract. And Rudolf doesn't have very, important cataracts. Let's see if you can see there. Let's see if you can see the screen. There you go. And, and, and if you look very closely, you're going to see a posterior capsular, posterior capsular cataract right, right in the center of the axis. So Rudolf comes with a vision of 2030, but the quality of vision that we're going to see, you know, is very well compromised. And he has some, um, 
some light problems in the night when he's driving. Can you see there? That's the other eye. Let's see yeah. if you can see the posterior. So capsular, great. And Rudolf, thank you. So I'm gonna, you know, he, he, I already talked to him. He knows a little bit about this, but I'm gonna communicate with him completely different in what, you know, it's gonna be A and B. And I would love for the panel also to, to correct me and see what, to see what changes in this communication. When I say, Rudolf, okay, you have cataracts. Do I? Yes, you do. <laughs> you have cataracts. You, your vision, your vision seems to be normal, okay? I Since, think so, yeah. Okay, but when we, when we study you a little bit more, the quality of vision, it's compromised, especially at night when you are driving and you have a light that coming to you. And we're gonna uh, do fecal emulsification in your eye because you have astigmatism and we're gonna implant a toric IOL. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, exactly. I don't know what to say. You know, and I think sometimes, you know, we are talking about this language and we, all, these all many different words. It's like, I'm talking with an economist talking about, you know, so th these different things are inflation. And, so the, the thing here, I think we need to improve. Kelly, uh, you, you were talking about this. You were talking about communication, which, which is your, um, which are the secrets for you when you're communicating with the patient? Do you have also a person that helps you in how to educate them? Um, so yeah, we do use some visual things like site selector or Rendia. Those are very helpful to give the patient an idea of what happens. Because a lot of patients will say, well, what will happen to my vision or what's going to happen if I don't correct astigmatism? And so there are, you know, kind of tricky conversations there too. So you'll say, well, you know, things will come into focus at different places. And so things will be blurry if you don't correct your astigmatism. And occasionally you'll have a patient who actually has astigmatism and walks around most of their life and doesn't wear glasses. And those are always the tough ones for me too, because they'll say, well, you know what? I have it, but I don't really, I'm not wearing my glasses. And usually that's a point where I'll talk to the patient about the fact that today, when we checked your vision, we did a refraction, we checked you for glasses. We saw that it would improve your vision, that there's a difference between not needing glasses and not wearing glasses. And so what we want to do is for you not to wear glasses and also not to need them to have the best quality of vision. So that's a little pearl for how to uh, address that particular thing. But usually the way that I explain it is that uh, astigmatism correction is a quality of vision issue. If we're going to do something special for you to help you with your vision, I think there's always great value in improving the quality of your vision. So that's where we start. So we talk about astigmatism, the fact that your cornea, the clear window in the front of the eye has a curvature. And when it's more steeply curved in one direction than another, that mismatch in curvature is what your astigmatism is. So we want to correct for that. So you have a nice, clear quality of vision result with your surgery. Very good one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I'm going to steal a couple of those concepts. They, they were very good. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I also, uh, like uh, Dr. McCabe said, uh, I think what is important it is to explain what is astigmatism, why we need to correct astigmatism for the patient. Sometimes I, I show the topo, some exams of the patient, like topo, the number of uh, the magnitude of the astigmatism for, for the patient, and uh, to explain the benefits of, of this correction, like uh, quality of vision and less dependence of uh, glasses. Very good one, I agree. And that this is why we do all this uh, patient education and we show you guys uh, uh, the simulator, the simulator of astigmatism. If, if we show the patient how the visual acuity with astigmatism is, Evo. Then, uh, there, Evo. there's also, just, yes. One thing that I think is very important that we should tell patients is that the cataract surgery is an opportunity that they have to fully yeah. correct astigmatism yeah. once in a lifetime. So it's very important that they use that opportunity to correct that. It, sometimes they ask, but can I correct it later? Well, maybe you could correct it with laser vision correction or you could do a supplemental IOL. But if you could do it in one single surgery, the toric IOL implant is your best choice here. So I usually say that to the patient. 
I, I like that word, the opportunity. I think that's great. Uh, ama amazing idea as well. You know, you, I always learn something new. Um, and, and there's another issue. I don't want to talk deep into this, but there is a, there, it's an issue and we all know it. Sometimes it's hard to talk about it, but it's about price. And, you know, maybe some colleagues, they have an assistant and they have an amazing secretary that knows about it, but there's a lot of colleagues are, uh, that they don't have that. And then sometimes they need to talk about maybe not the price, but the, this technology is more expensive than, you know, a, a regular cataract survey with a monofocal. So that's another thing I, we learned from Dr. Flicker from, from Costa Rica, something amazing that he will say, if we end the, this discussion with Radolf saying, you have, as to, you have cataracts, right? And you need surgery. And that surgery needs a monofocal IOL. But you also have the chance, you know, you also have astigmatism and you need to correct that. And that IOL, it's more expensive. What happens with everybody when you say this is more expensive, right? We need to understand the value proposition of, of the, of the because you wear glasses, you know, maybe you, you did refractive surgery, but now you're using glasses. Maybe you yes, could. Yes, after, after I told you, I had the surgery 25 years ago. Um, I, I'm using glasses since the age of 12. Uh, I had the surgery when I was 38. And it was 12 years without glasses. And after 12 years, I had to use glasses. To use glasses again. Okay. So that's that's very interesting because when I'm saying, you know, I have this technology and now I have another technology that is more expensive and then I have another lens that is more expensive. What if we change that way of communication? And, you know, as I was saying, we use physical, uh, you know, uh, models to understand first, what is a cataract? Second, what it's an IOL, right? And third, wh why, you know, what is a toric IOL? And like Caesar say, amazing, you have the opportunity. Right now you have the opportunity to solve two problems in one, okay? When you just rephrase that, and we also use, you know, a video as I showed you before in Brendia. And now I switch, you know, my, um, my communication, but saying, you have now, uh, we did all the examination and you have not only cataract, but another problem. You have two problems and we can solve those two problems in one surgery with one technology. That changes, right? What do you think? It does. Well, my question is what are the risks? Um, how long does this give me a better view? Will it deteriorate over time? What happens, let's say in 10 years or in 15 years? That's a very good question. Okay. And I have a friend that, that was saying, right? Cataract surgery is a one time only event in your life, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's good to invest in something that's gonna be one time only. And to answer your question, this technology will do their work for the rest of your days. Mm -hmm. So it's a good investment, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's very interesting. And another example, so there's some people that say, oh, I don't want the Toric IOL because it's too expensive. And then they, they end spending that money in air glasses, right? So then again, there is a lot of things to talk about, but I think you 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 have a couple of of secrets. The other thing we did uh, with Rudolf it was very important it was to talk about look at these guys. We we went to talk about uh, to to see uh, if if he had a dry eye or not. As as you can see there, he had a dry eye, and we also look at the breakup time there in two seconds. So he has a dry eye. We need to take, you know, need to be, we need to be careful when we're measuring the keratometry. Let's put the meibomian glands there. You're gonna see that he has an evo evaporative dry eye. And look at look at how, you know, the meibomian glands are all affected. And so he has an evaporative dry eye. So guys, if you want to get into the toric world and the trifocal world also, it's very important. And just to end, let's try to put the cataract overview and basically the quality of life, because we, the quality of vision, sorry. Um, we also, it, and it's very important to understand what the quality of vision of the PCF, this is a, an OPD from NIDIC. Put me the quality of vision just to end. And, you know, sometimes we're talking about the Snellen and the 40, the, the 2040 or the, 20, the 2030 vision. 
But if we go to the quality of vision here, let's look at what the PSF and the MeTF are. So she's constant sensitivity, constant, constant sensitivity is very affected. You know, this is a simulated vision of him, as you can see there with the astigmatism, the quality of vision, it's down. And the PCF, I love that, that parameter. It's like if a rate of light will go into the retina, how you will see it and look at that, look at that dispersion. So she will improve a lot with a cataract surgery and who will improve a lot with a toric IOL to correct the astigmatism. I think, and also when I'm showing you, right, objective uh, images of what's happening to the optics of your eye, I think it's a little better, right? It's impressive, it's amazing, yeah. Well, Rudolf, thank you so much for your time, for being here with us. Thank you. We already have the measurements there, so we're gonna, we're gonna do the simulated surgery until now, <laughs> okay? And all this, thank all right. you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so let's go back. Guys, and let's see the measurements. Okay, so let's see which camera is following us. So now we have the master and now we have, well, we have two things actually, because we have, let's see, Juan Manuel, we have, we did a, a, a measurement that it's more static and one that is more dynamic. So we have, the left eye from Rudolf here, and I would love Dr. Pauline to tell us a little, a little bit more about it. Okay, well, this is a good example of, of uh, the importance of the location of the main incision. So what we have here is uh, with the rule astigmatism. Uh, we have the steep meridian here. Uh, it's a with the rule around 72, 73 degrees, and this is uh, this is the left eye, right? Yes, this is the, the left eye. So, for example, in here. If you're a Latin American surgeon <laughs> and you're used to make a superior wound main incision, probably what you just want to do is to locate your main incision here in the steep meridian, and maybe your patient doesn't need a, a, an toric IOL. Let, let's look for the. This is very interesting, guys, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep looking about the, you know the comments from 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 the public, please. Okay, so this is pretty much what, what I was saying. If you go to the calculator. It will say that if you, you locate your main incision in the steep meridian, uh, your patient does not need a toric IOL. And this is important because, for example, you will see that the, maybe the magnitude of the astigmatism is a little bit higher if you don't go with a toric IOL. And you have a, a, a smaller amount of astigmatism if you go with a toric IOL. But this is important. You'll have a conversion of the axis and uh, convert this astigmatism from a with the rule to an against the rule astigmatism. And again, this could may not sound important, but if you're planning an, uh, uh, an implementation of a multifocal, trifocal IOL, this is very, very important. For example, I have, I've seen, I've, hear, I've heard some uh, surgeons that still, they, they like some uh, a small amount of against the rule astigmatism to have some uh, near vision enhancement when they, they go with a non-multifocal non IOL. And they are trying to apply that experience from years ago to these new technology lenses, to do these new multifocal IOLs, and the result are, is completely different with these patients. So again, what do we want? Do we want the, small, the smaller amount of astigmatism or do we want to respect the original axis? And this could change your decision, for example, if this was a patient with a, an against the rule astigmatism, I will feel very comfortable to just turn this patient to, uh, to uh, with the rule astigmatism with a small amount of astigmatism and start all over again uh, with his cornea and, and, and buy some time in, in the eight years to come. Right. So, so always look not only to the amount of astigmatism, but to the original axis and take your decisions. Name, last name, and where you're doing in the incision, guys, exactly. very, very important. We wanted to show you, okay, a first calculator because the important thing here is, you know, with the correct technology, it doesn't need to have, you know, th th this amount of technology. You can have an amazing practice with toric IOLs. So let's go back, the back now to Varian because in Varian, what we're gonna have, please, let's the go. master again, we're gonna have a more dynamic calculation. And here you're gonna see, Okay. A more dynamic thing, you know, about what's happening with the calculator. Okay, so um, if we're looking at, uh, at the screen here, 
the, the display of the gradient has a lot of things, but maybe if we can put our attention here, this is a non toric IOL and a Christoph IQ. And if we play a little bit with the location here of the main incision, you'll see that, for example, if I locate uh, the main incision uh, at the superior location, uh, uh, just in the place with the with the steep meridian, you'll see that the cylinder is very small and the the variant does not recommend a toric IOL. But it's, if if I like to do my incision in the in the temporal location, you'll see that automatically the baryon uh, turns into yellow uh, to, to make us notice that this, that this patient, if you make this kind of decision, maybe he will, uh, it, it will be better to put, uh, to implant a toric IOL. So we can change here, if we we'll, uh, put our attention here, to, we change the type of IOL, we choose now a toric IOL, and you will see that we have a recommendation. Uh, for example, look at here. If we implant uh, T2, we'll have a very small astigmatism, astigmatism of maybe 0.26 diopters. If we choose a T3, it's gonna be a smaller astigmatism, just 0.07, but you're gonna turn the astigmatism of the patient from a with the rule to an against the rule. And again, you always have to see that not just put attention to the amount of residual astigmatism, but the axis, what's happening with the axis and take your decisions. So in this case, for example, the Evo, I would prefer it, it's, it's good for my kind of surgery or the things I like to do at the OR, maybe with your patient, I will just locate my incision yeah. here. I, 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 want, I want the people to understand that how amazing it is to change we know where the incision is going to be and how everything is changing, right? Because here we have Caddy. We said it again, and we're going to go temporal in order to her, right? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we end with the toric, but this is what, what you were saying before, right? If Caddy is doing this in the US, we, she can have an amazing result with the toric. Exactly. And here in Latin America, we can have an amazing uh, result without it. But this is because it's dynamic. Fernando. Tell us a little, a little bit more about what, what do you think, Fernando? You, you, we know you, you love Toric IOLs and you love the planning. Evo, uh, Varion and now calculator is great because it includes posterior astigmatism. So it's more accurate in the prediction of the residual astigmatism after surgery. Uh, and for the calculator, uh, we have now improved uh, CIA accuracy using the centroid. For the key readings, you should use optical biometry and topo or tomo. Topo is essential to check the axis and exclude uh, irregular astigmatism. Uh, it's essential to validate your biometric data, especially the key readings uh, for a patient for a toric uh, IOL. Take more than one measurement, uh, either with two different devices or the same device, and validate the quality of your key readings. Look at the Myers. Uh, like you, you showed the, the rings of the placido disc and we measure and treat your ocular surface uh, like the, in this patient as necessary to get good readings. Uh, it's easy to use and it's great, the Barrick toric calculator and value. Yes, Cesar, any, any thoughts about what we're doing in this dynamic planning of toric IOLs? Yeah, that's that's really close to the state of art of planning and the best outcome for a patient. So a uh, few concepts here. The, um, the, the uh, understanding that the corneal incision plays a role in your management, you know, your man, you know, in your management of astigmatism um, is very important. So you, you should understand the amount of astigmatism you put in, in your incision. So let's say you, you do FACO with a 2.75, not a 2.4 or 2.2 glucoron incision. You're gonna induce more astigmatism. And one concept that you should have in mind is not only to, uh, at least not correct, but not to induce astigmatism on your surgery. So if you have the option to not induce and maintain that amount of astigmatism there on your incision, that is key to success even with um, even with you know, non aspheric lenses, if it were simple lenses to get the, the patient a best outcome as possible by doing a simple thing as a twist of hand, 
just changing a little bit the axis of the incision. Uh, it's something that it's easily, um, it's not so difficult to, to master in your surgical practice. Um, the ver yes, uh, yes, please go on. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to, 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 I think you just said something very important. Mm -hmm. And if we want to correct, to, to have the control of the correction of the astigmatism, we have to do 2.2 or less uh, uh, incision size uh, wounds. Because if we, we want to, to, to correct patients uh, with a toric IOL or a multifocal IOL, and we keep our surgery with 3.0 or 2.2 millimeters, we're going to lose the control of the axis of the, and the correction. So it's very important to, to, to say that all the concepts that we're, we're saying here, we're talking about 2.2 or less uh, millimeters of, of, of the size of the, of the main incision. Very good. Uh, in my opinion, I think 2.4 millimeters is still a very acceptable size for incision. Um, it's very important to understand that not only the size, but the position is also important. So if you go too clear corneal, you're gonna be that gonna influence the incision uh, astigmatism way more than if you go a near corneal, at least limbal corneal incision. Yes. Um, the, the, the way you do the incision is also important. So if you use a blade um, straightforward it may induce a little more. If you do a biplanar incision, it may induce a little less. If you do a laser femtosecond incision, it will depend on how you create it. And you should always analyze your outcomes. And you should also look for your surgical induced astigmatism to put in a good number in your calculator and have the best outcomes possible. Yeah, I was just good, going to emphasize the same exact thing that it's consistency. That's mm. the key. So you just want to know that you're doing, you're having the same effect on the astigmatism every single time. Your geometry is the same. The size of the incision is the same. How far into the clear cornea is the same. And even with all of that consistency, there'll still be a difference in the effect if you're superior versus temporal because of how close it is to the center of the cornea. So you still have to be a little careful, but the more you can stay consistent and understand the effect that you're having on astigmatism, the more you can factor factor that in and get a better result, so very important. Very, very, good. very good one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit more planning. Then we go to surgery. But again, right? We're talking about the patient. We're talking about the characteristics of the orbit of the patient. Then at the characteristics of the eye, the astigmatism, the measurement, the axis, the magnitude of the astigmatism. If it's with the rule against the rule, the name and the last name, I'm loving that one. Um, and the, the calculation and the planning. And we end that with the consistency as Katie says, right? So we need to do always the same thing. We need to understand our, our hands and our, and our outcomes, right? To, okay. to, to plan correctly. Any other thoughts about, you know, because what I love from Burion is the possibility to already have the expected outcomes and change from, for example, from a formula that has uh, into account the posterior uh, cornea and ones that they don't. What do you think? Well, it's always important to remember the, the impact of the posterior corneal astigmatism. And you have to remember that if you have a with the rule astigmatism, the posterior corneal effect is gonna make a smaller uh, 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 total refractive astigmatism. And the opposite is gonna happen if we have an, an against the rule. So we have formulas like, like Barrett that will do that for you. But it, 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 it's, I say, it's always important to, to have that in consideration, not just to, to let the formula do the, the work for you, but to make a really a, a very good refractive plan of what's happening with your patient. And I totally agree with what was said before. Don't uh, uh, take your decision based on just one technology. Repeat your exams, make two or three, uh, or three type uh, different of technologies, combine IOL Master with Pentacam with Galilei, so you can verify the axis and the magnitude of your astigmatism. And uh, I think if, if you do that, if you combine different technologies, your, your, your approach to the patient is gonna be better and you're gonna take be better, better decisions. And um, it's always controversial to speak about the incision size and location because some surgeons like me like to move and make a dynamic uh, FACO and it's, no, it's, it's, it's always a different position depending on the patient. That's one way of doing it. Another way, I think it's a, it's a good way, is to make always uh, a, the same incision in the same location. 
if you're gonna do that, if you'd rather do that and not change, not making a, a, a dynamic surgery, it always be, it, it, it will always be better to make a small incision at 2.2 or 2.4 at the, at the temporal uh, in a temporal approach in a temporal location. That's a, a more neutral incision. You're gonna impact, impact less the, the previous astigmatism of the patient, and, and you're gonna have more control. And your calculators are gonna be better and more precise if you do all your incisions in the, in the temporal location. So that's gonna be maybe a little bit tricky or, or harder for Latin American surgeons that we're not used, we're, we're not trained like that, but it, I think it's a very good peril to, to move your incisions to a temporal uh, location if you don't want to make a dynamic surgery or, or a dynamic effect. Juan. Okay, I, guys. Yes, yes. Uh, Please, one, yes. one more comment, Ivo uh, and Juan and everyone um, about consistency that Dr. McCabe said. And I think it's key to understand that consistency doesn't necessarily mean that the measurements are going to be exactly the same. They're probably not going to be exactly the same because the technology that the measurements are doing, it's differently. It's different based on, on the machine you're using. So for example, you're, you were showing before the NIDAC OPD Scan 3, which uses placido disc measurements. Um, if you use a Pentacam or Galilei, they're going to use Shineflow camera. If you use the IOL Master 700, they're going to use telecentric carotometry which is basically reflect, reflect, reflectometry. And they differ on the area of the cornea and the technology that they're using. So we're gonna end up with different measurements, probably different magnitude, and maybe different axes as well. You don't need to, you don't need to have the exact, same, the exact same number, but they should be similar at least. And they also should line up with the patient's refraction. Um, so th that points to consistency all the way through. Um, looking at the K values, you could average them yourself. There are online formulas that could average them. You could go to the Barrett online Tori calculator that allow you to put several K values on the website and get an average, um, a vectorial average of the um, astigmatism, which is actually better than just doing a mathematical, a, a arithmetic measurement. Um, but you could also, you know, check for your best uh, access your best measurements and go for it. And if they're very similar and they're consistent, you're going to get a good outcome with your toric implant. Very good, Cesar. So let's go to one of the fun parts, right? So we do all this preparation and we talk to the patient and we do some measurements, but we like the surgery, right? Oh, we like to do the surgery. And in this case, uh, I hope you can see, you know, me from around and from another camera. I'm with amazing technology. I'm with a Luxor, with a Centurion, with Ingenuity watching in 3D. Let's see if you can see here. And let's try to put the image, please, uh, the one that comes out from the surgery, okay? Uh, and you're gonna see, look at that. Look at that beauty. Uh, the, and then again, in, from, in honor to Kelly, we're gonna do it temporal. And you're going to also see in the overlay. So we're, we're talking about consistency and we to know what to do and what an amazing thing to have a machine that tells you perfectly where do you need to do the incision, which is the correct size of the capsular rexis, and then it's going to help you to align the toric IOL. So you have a, this, this is kind of a, a fun joke between Juan Manuel and me, but, but I have here, I, I hope you, I have a 2.8 and a 2.2. What do you think about that? You know, I, I was waiting to tell him, you know, <laughs> because he he's, you know, he loves 2.2 in session yes. and we are talking about in this astigmatism. What are your thoughts on that while I'm starting this? Well, I think just what I said a few minutes ago, if you're trying to, to con really control the impact of your incision and your, your refractive results, you need to avoid 2.8 or, or, or bigger or higher incisions. You, you, we're obligated to, to make a small incision cataract surgery, 2.2, 2.4. And if, if you can, locate it in a temporal section. And I did it, as, as you can see there, I have the mark and I did it temporally. I like to do a three plane incision, okay? And also, you know, I, I, didn't do, I did it very, you know, limbo. Do you, do, do you like that too, Juan Manuel? You know, just to, to don't induce that much astigmatism or you already know your, your outcomes and you do it? You need more clear cornea. Well, of course, the distance from the limbus will, will affect the impact of, of the, the effect of the wound. Uh, uh, I like to make a clear wound uh, incision, but, but just immediately to the limbus, not, okay. not, not too far from the limbus. Okay, so um, 
let's see what I did. There you go. Perfect. So uh, one important thing, guys, it's like I, I'm changing in the variant. I did the incision, and now we're going to do the size of the capsular rexis. The You are seeing the overlay. Let's see it then again, please, guys. The, there you go. And look at that. Look at that beauty. I'm, I'm, so the, the machine is telling me which is the correct size of the capsular rexis. So what I'm going to do is with a sister comb, I'm going to create the flap. I'm going to try to respect the size of the capsular rexis. Gary, tell us a little more about that. Are you one of those Americans who do the entire capsular rexis with a cystotome? No, actually, I do the whole thing with no cystotome, just the utrata. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the opposite. <laughs> okay. What, what about the rest of the of the crew there? Tell me a little bit. Uh, some tips about the incisions. Some tips about the capsular rexis. The capsular rexis with, uh, with the image guided variant uh, is great. Uh, it's, it may be a little trickier than the model eye because the eye will move slightly. And sometimes the mire need, takes a little while to adjust, um, like that, for example. Um, it, it is important with the torical well that you have a, not a very big capsular rexis or the eye well may not be stable. So if you're uh, if you're in uh, if you're not sure if you're making a very large capsule X or a very small, you I would prefer going slightly smaller rexes just to make sure that the lens is gonna be well placed into the capsule bag. There you go. I don't want to show off, but <laughs> I don't know if you saw that rexes uh, on the side. Beautiful. Did you like it, sister? Did you like it, sister? <laughs> yeah, I I would let you put a torque in my patient. Let me sure. show off a little bit in this one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Andres Bernal, who is, you know, a good friend from this eyes, is extremely happy, you know, and understanding that, you know, you can learn so much from this eyes. Next, in the, the next webisode, you know, we're going to talk a lot about this. This is going to behave like a hard cataract. And, you know, we're doing some harder dissection. Uh, again, guys, for those who are there, there's no excuses anymore. We can all learn how to do fake, or we can all learn how to do, you know, Sorry, KOLs. And you know, let's start about let's talk about techniques. I'm pretty sure that many of you guys talk about techniques. Tell, tell me a little bit about your preferred technique to, to do fake emulsification. Well, um, I think uh, as time goes by, you you get more conservative. You do whatever your troubles. That's a, that's Mostly, a good uh, concept. I like that one. Yeah, because uh, the, the first years I, I always try to approach the cataract with a with a FICO chop technique, and now I have come back to a pre chop or or a stop and chop technique, which I think it's safer, and give, not 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 to make a, a very fast surgery, but a very calm. But a safe calm, one, right? Safe one, right? Yeah, the, these patients that they, you know they like torix and they like everything, you know, these guys want good results. What about you, Caddy? That you are in the U.S. What, what is your preferred FACO surgery technique? technique? Yeah, yeah. So I've I've kind of made a journey, just uh, just as you were saying before, too, where stop and chop is kind of where I started. Then I did pre-chop, then mostly vertical chopping, and now I either vertical chop or pre-chop, or not. Sorry, vertical chop or stop and chop. The stop and chop is one of those really reliable, always safe works for every density. Um, and I agree, it's not always about speed. It's more about quality of the surgery, being safe and uh, being meticulous and consistent. Good one. Cesar? Yeah, you, you can be fast without being too fast. So you don't really need to do it for <laughs> in five minutes. That's you don't need to too. do that. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't like to have my eye done in a very fast way. I would like to have it well done. So uh, you can have a very good surgery in very, food, very good cataract surgery in 10 to 15 minutes with all the details that you need to uh, have on with a very consistent fracture technique because what happens when you do a inconsistent fracture is you're gonna end up increasing your time surgery, increasing your ultrasound on time. And that may damage the cornea way more. That may even damage the incision which you that's so much effort to do in a good position, not to induce astigmatism. You may um, induce more astigmatism and you may worsen your outcome as well. Um, yes, not to mention you may no, have no, corneal no, edema, no, which no, will worsen no, the no, experience no, the next day or next week, maybe. So um, 
people you don't want to do it. You don't want to have it. You want to have. You don't want to have a fast surgery. You want to have a well done surgery for sure. Very good one, uh, Fernando. Any thoughts about the, the technique? What I'm doing is I love to do you know one hand technique. Uh, I'm gonna try to do a sculpting in you know just for for teaching purposes. I think you're having a very very hard cataract, and I'm gonna try to sculpt so you can see. Yes, sorry. I think it is a kind of surgery for a toric IOL. Yeah, uh, it begins with the incision, uh, uh, well done uh, three plane incisions because after the toric implant, uh, you, you get a seal very well the incision. I, I think very is, is great to improve toric alignment. Uh, and I used to, to make a small, not, not big rexes rexes because I, I think it's, it's more stable for the toric eye well to, to, to position the toric eye well. I think that's a really good point that you want to make sure that there's overlap, uh, at least, you know, a small overlap that's consistent around the entire okay. edge of the optic. Okay. And after the surgery is do... stable, because all, otherwise the, the eye well will uh, rotate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, uh, yes, yes, sorry, Katie. Please. No, no, just that it's also important to, I think, uh, remove viscoelastic from behind the IOL, yeah. especially in the case of a toric IOL. I do it with all of my cases. Um, some people are, don't want to really do that, but if you're putting in a, a toric lens, I think it's really critical to be sure you've removed uh, viscoelastic from b behind the IOL. That's a very good one too. So all the tips then for surgery, let's go back to all the tips. Uh, where the surgery, the incision, it's very important. The location, the architecture, the capsular rexis uh, size. And, you know, just, I wanna go fast and I wanna implant that IOL and go right back to Laura and keep talking about, you know, toric IOLs, you know, we're doing surgery almost every Wednesday and people get a very interesting, very important, you know, uh, idea that you can learn a lot with this kind of eye. Let's put some viscoelastic and put the toric IOL. So let's let's start the, the overlay again and put the stupid meridian and put the toric IOL. Evil. Any, uh, any, yeah, I would like to about the audience who doesn't have Varian. Also, you know, how you how you mark the eye or any tips about marking the, the eye with a, for a toric IOL? You know, uh, I use a pretty low tech way to mark uh, as well, where I have a slit lamp that's just outside the OR where I can put huh? the slit beam based on a gauge on the slit lamp uh, at the exact axis I want my torque to be. And then I take a cystotome. The only time I actually use a cystotome. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I put a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, ink on the end of the cystotome. And then I just make a tiny little puncture in the peripheral cornea right on the axis that my toric needs to be. And so the ink mark is really only the size of the cystotome point. And those actually will stay, you know, sometimes they're there even a week, week later. So you can see that your toric is still aligned exactly where you wanted it to be. Very good one. Any other thoughts, Cesar, Fernando? Evo. Uh, yes. It's so important to remove all the viscoelastic, but I, I don't I don't leave the the IOL in the exact position. I put uh, uh, a little a less, one. and then I remove all the viscoelastic, and then I put the the IOL the toric IOL in the alignment, in the exact position after removing all the viscoelastic. But it's it's very important to remove behind the IOL. Excellent, excellent one. A any other tips, Caesar? I do like to rotate the lens 360 degrees uh, as I am removing the viscoelastic to make sure that I am removing everything that may be adhered to the haptics of the lens as well. And after that, I use only BSS to position the lens within the capsular bag. Um, one thing that's, that's important, especially for high myopic eyes, which are very large uh, with a very deep interior chamber, um, you don't want to over inflate the eye because that may ease uh, the rotation of the lens after the surgery. You will have a expanded bag. So you want to have it compact, right? 
you want to have it tight uh, so your lens will be stable. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes I press the, the lens a little bit against the capsule bag just to make sure that it won't rotate. And sometimes when I'm not so sure about it, I even try the eye. I, I, get, I get a forceps or something and I try it a little bit just to see how stable it is. And normally it gets stable when I do all these steps. I aspirate the viscoelastic behind the lens, rotate the lens, um, position it, uh, not try not to inflate the bag and then press it. And it's usually a good thing. You know, yeah. a really highly myopic eye with a big bag like that, sometimes I'll even put a CTR in yeah. uh, just to be sure that, you know, ensure that it's not going to rotate postoperatively. A very good cops. Actually, there is, there is some colleagues that they put it in every turret case. It's, it's interesting. It's something to, to discuss in the future. Very good one, Katie, too. Uh, so again, oh. uh, yes. I, I try to hydrate the incisions before the end of the surgery because uh, I think it's the anterior chamber is more stable. And I, I usually press the IOL against the, the capsule. So it keeps uh, tight with the capsule. I press uh, with the uh, IA. Uh, Thank you. To keep uh, it just, warm. Just, uh -huh. just to, finish this, uh, to finish this part, uh, I think there is something very important we need to understand is, uh, from going to a monofocal to a toric, it seems easy and actually it is easy, but you know, we need to master many different steps and many little details. You know, the success is in the details, but I think you saw many, many of them. And you saw that with the correct technology and the correct planning, you can have very, very uh, uh, successful uh, cases in, in your hands. Before we put we put it the eye oil, we have another chance that technology is letting us and it's the aura, or the intraocular aberrometry that will help us to refine those little, you know, uh, details about the toric IOLs uh, it, it live in, in, the, in the eye, just, you know, waiting to implant that eye. Uh, so Juan Manuel is there with the aura, we're gonna go back, back there and we're gonna see the case and you guys are gonna have a, um, and a, and a real experience how the aura works. So let's go there and we have the patient, Juan Manuel. Yeah, yes, do, do you want me to show the, the display of the aura? Yes, please. Just, just, and also, you know, how, how it works, you know, when you are in a fake kick, what are the tips there when you're doing the measurement? Okay, and then... I don't know if we had a video how it looks when the patient is looking to, to, the, to the, this red dot. Okay, so when you have the aura, you're, you're completed your surgery and you have extracted all the cataract. So this is when the aura starts to work. And what you do is in, a, in an, a fake state, you fill your eye with viscoelastic, you have a tonometer. So you verify that, that the pressure of the eye is precise to, to make the measures. And then you ask the patient, some, 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 some considerations about the anesthetics so you will have to take it right now because you have your patient conscient and looking forward straight to the, to, to the, to the aura, to the light, that the aura has, and the, the, the aura is gonna make 40 shots or 40 uh, measurements of the aberrometry. It's, a, it's an intraoperative uh, operative aberrometry that the aura is gonna make. So uh, the aura is gonna give you the, uh, uh, the calculation of the spherical value of the AOL and the astigmatism and the axis of the astigmatism of the patient in real time in an intraoperative interpretive manner or way. So this is how pretty much it looks. And here we have this patient uh, that we make one, two, three, four, five different measurements. And you can decide and see which measurement was better, which uh, correlates with your preoperative uh, refractive target and, and planeation and projection of, of, of the case. And for example, if we decide, for example, here, we're gonna see that, that the, uh, in this case, uh, this is a very inter interesting thing. We have two lines here. Uh, the blue line tells us what was the axis and magnitude of the, of the patient before the surgery. And the green line is gonna show us the actual uh, magnitude and, of, and the axis of the astigmatism after we finish the surgery and after the impact of our corneal incision, of our corneal wound. And you'll see there's gonna be different. And this is where the, the calculators try to manage to make, compensate the difference between the original axis and the residual axis before 
and after the incision. So you can decide which uh, which take was better. You can decide which one you feel more comfortable comfortable with. And after that, we uh, only need to uh, choose one of these. And and you will see, for example, here that with, if we choose a T4, we're gonna, we're gonna have the smaller amount of residual astigmatism, just a 0.07 with a with a with this axis. So this is pretty much Evo how the how the order works. And we have another surprise for you, a very, very good friend, Dr. Velasquez from Costa Rica, who oh, is a lover of this machine. Roberto, thank you for being here with us. What are your comments about- yeah, Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Eva. Hi, Dr. Pauline. Yes, I believe there's uh, three things that I haven't spoken until now. One, I believe that the astigmatism is a decision from the doctor to make, not the patient. Second, I always tell Never leave astigmatism behind. That means that you have to treat them, it's a must. And there's so many variables to take in consideration and there's so many formulas to take in consideration that you could get lost in the way. So I believe that analyzing your outcomes will make you a better um, surgeon. We, we call them like the premium surgeon, you know? Why? Because when you're analyzing, like Dr. Pauline said, you know, where is your incision? And then we're talking about how big is my incision and how big is my wound and the posterior astigmatism. And then we have to take in consideration that the lens can have a tilt. And then we have all the other variables. And one of the most important that I believe that we forgot is the effective position of the lens. And over time, uh, there's different formulas that try to say, you know, this is where the lens is gonna end. So it's hard to have a perfect patient. So there's so many variables, but when you analyze with aura, which I just become a lover, uh, like three or four years ago, if you input your data, you only need 25, I believe to 30 cases for lens, and then you will have your surgeon factor. That means that it will take in consideration what you do, only you as a surgeon. So you don't have to take other information from the world, only you. And then with that surgeon factor and the uh, factor that it's called WTF, the, the weight tech factor, they will let you know which is the best possible outcome of what you input the aura to do. So for example, if you're a monofocal user and you wanna have a monovision and you put a, a spherical equivalent of minus one diopter, that's what aura is gonna help you achieve. And if you want to have a trifocal with a toricity, you will have actually very good outcomes. So analyzing these outcomes with the aura, it comes with this software called the analyzer. I believe that you, after 15 days, you have to put the input of the data of the patients. And one of the things that we forgot, and I have heard, you know, talk about is we use different machines. We use tomography, we use topography, we use actually even uh, auto refractors. And if we try to use different data, when we're trying to analyze, that's when we could have uh, things that are not coming right as we want to. So always use the same machine to have the same data. So if you're using IO Master, introduce IO Master measurement after you do the surgery to see how much astigmatism you're inducing and how much um, you know, your patients are, are getting. So I believe in a nutshell, you know, my pearl for tonight, Use technology, put your data, analyze your data, and you will have better outcomes over time. Look at that, Roberto. It, it's like plan. Look at that, the slide I had for you. It's like, you know, perfect timing, right? This is an amazing slide. And I want to go back to that. That's Florence Nightingale. And that's, that's the, one of the first thing, uh, times that in medicine, we started to talk about data in the Crimea War. And she was doing this kind of graphic to understand why where people were dying from. And they were not dying from, you know, from, you know, from a bullet or something. They were dying from infections. And with antibiotics, he, he, she was able to, to, to solve that. So th that's the importance of data. And this is, uh, you know, the way that Dr. Velasquez was talking about how we can see our data when we use the analyzer. What is the analyzer is the software that will help you to grab all your data on all the patients you're doing in the aura and look at that th those images. Uh, I think they're amazing. They're about multifocal toric IOLs and you start understanding 
how your you know from your preoperative or postoperative uh, results are. Look at that. That this is from Dr. Velasquez. I'm going fast for matters of time because we want a little discussion from with the panel. But it's his data compared with the global data, and that's what we call the benchmarking. How important it is for us to understand how are we doing and compare ourselves with the world. I think those are very very interesting things. And Dr. Velasquez, this is something very very amazing that I would like you to share with the audience as well. Okay, and here as you see at the screen, you have this red circle showing you this platinum level, you know? The more data you put, you input, you will get your personal customization. I mean, your, your lens are gonna be optimized by your own personal surgical factor. So when you have this gray line over there, you means that you're platinum, you reach at the top. Now, this is panoptic and panoptic toric lenses. And actually with this data, someone in another part of the world will be benefit because of the data that I introduced. So we need to work together. So actually when we start doing panoptics four years ago, all this data went for the US data. So when you start putting your data as a panoptic user, not so long ago, that's because the data that we introduce we make mistake when we start doing panoptics. And you know, the lens, the first two lens we had, we, we had residual of plus one of a sphere. So, you know, we then, we did LASIK, but we work with that. And then all over time, we're having great outcomes with panoptics and with panoptic torics. And, and, and we can always reach almost like 90 or above uh, plus um, 0 0.50 of a spherical equivalent. So I believe this is, what you need to do if you want to reach as a global premium surgeon, you need to reach for your own outcomes and you have to become yourself a platinum member in the aura. So the only way to do that is 15 days after you finish the surgery, make someone introduce the data. You can do that on the variant or you can do that on the web. And the only thing you need to input is your vision, your, your uh, uncorrected distal vision and corrected distal vision and then you need to put your refraction and the keratometries. That's it. And Aura will make everything for you. And every quarter, every four months, you will receive all your personal of the surgical factor of your optimized lens constants improve. And then you decide if you want to make them. So in my last years, I have seen how my patients are getting better over time because I'm using this information. And if we work together, and if, for example, I'm going to introduce the first BBT in my country, and I have never used the BBT before, I will use the global data to have a good outcomes. Because in the US, they're using BBT so now, right now, and in other parts of the world. So if I use the global data, I will be ahead, or if I will start by myself. And after I put another 25 cases, then I will be good planning them, and then it will take in my consideration how much of incision of astigmatism I'm inducing in my incision and all other factors that, you know, it could be variable because of the eyes and the lens and all of those things that we need to take into consideration. But at the end of the day, I believe that we need to work as a team worldwide. We need to put the data on so we can have better outcomes for all over the patients that we're looking because one day, at the end of the day, we're gonna be a patient as well. Thank you very much. And we are, we are uh, right in the end, I also wanted to show this amazing uh, technology that you can, you know, we're, we're, you're going to have a lot of news soon, but this is a way for you in an Excel to have your own data to calculate your own astigma, induced astigmatism and also have a lot of metrics of your patients. So the thing is, technology is there to help us to improve even with a lot of technology, with a few technology. I just want to make a quick comment because... There, we have Dr. Victor Perez here with us, you know, asking us, which is the, we have a famous Dr. Victor Perez. I don't know if he's him or maybe another one, but he's telling us, he's asking us, which is the maximum age to learn FACO? What do you say? For me, it's like, like to, to, to plant a tree, right? The best time was 10 years ago, but the second time is today. I think there is no age and you know, with this amazing technology, everybody can learn fake surgery. So, Dr. Perez, we, we will wait for you to for you to become a cataract surgeon. Okay, uh, we're finishing, and we go back 
to the same uh, slide we were in the beginning. I think we did a great job talking about all this amazing data. Again, we could talk about three, four, five hours about astigmatism. But going back to this slide, I would like the panel again to do some final remarks, it's starting for Caddy. Caddy, did, did you saw that? I did it temporarily. I did that fake or temporarily, in order to you. <laughs> I think I've made a con you're a convert now, right? Everything temporal from now on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I what think that, you know, the, the key thing is that, you know, astigmatism correction is within the reach of all cataract surgeons. And really it's just attention to detail, good communication with the patient, making sure you're consistent. Absolutely, you have to monitor your outcomes and make sure that what you're doing is actually getting the results that you are trying to. But it's, it, you don't have to have every single tool, every single toy to be very successful putting in toric lenses. And it's a service that all of our patients deserve. Very good, one. very one. My co-host too, watching this slide again, what are your final thoughts to, for people to, to take away? Well, I totally agree with what you have just said. I think it's what's your results. What happened with the astigmatism of your patient? Okay, you corrected it, but what happened? It is a much smaller amount. Did you respect the original axis? Did you flip it? And I think when you observe your results, when you put a name and the last name in your astigmatism, your, your, your outcomes are gonna be better. So just, just don't feel just, don't feel good if you just see a smaller amount of astigmatism, see what happened. Do you overcorrect it or you have a residual astigmatism? What happened with it? And take a decision. Amazing, the, the name and the last name, I think is one of the things people will, will remember. Fernando, yeah. it was great to have you here. Just some last remarks for yeah. the audience. It was great. I think uh, uh, correcting and managing astigmatism is, is important for all patients, especially for the prize biopa IOL candidates. And uh, pre-op evaluations are, are important than ever, especially for the key readings. Uh, some studies like the Hayashi show that uh, more than 0.5 diopter of, of residual astigmatism decreased visual acuity in patients that receive multifocal IOLs. So outcomes from many papers show that residual stigmatism is one of the main reasons of dissatisfaction uh, with multifocal IOLs. So make, uh, so make sure you don't leave these patients with more than 0.5 uh, of astigmatism. And it's quite clear if you use, for all patients, and especially if you use multifocal IOLs, uh, you have to address astigmatism, it's very important. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Fernando. It was such a pleasure to have you here with us. I know also Cesar, you know, part of the family. Some final remarks, Cesar? Yeah, I think managing astigmatism is committing to your best patient outcome as possible. So um, it is your job to identify it, to, uh, uh, to classify it as a treatable astigmatism, check for its consistency. If it's not consistent, it's to check what's going on. Does he have a corneal issue? Does he have epithelial membrane dystrophy? Uh, does, uh, does he have dry eye? So you have a, to address that. And maybe you have to postpone surgery to address these issues before so you can correct the patient better at the end of the, at the, end of the day. You will have, at the end of your treatment, you will have a better outcome. And that takes time. That takes time for you to, to educate your patient, to talk to him, to tell him exactly what he has. That gives actually what you were saying before, Ivo that gives value to your treatment. You're not selling a lens. You're not doing any surgery. You're doing the best treatment for that eye, for that patient, that's individual, and that's personalization. And that's what you're dealing with. Thank you very much, Cesar. I agree 100% with you. So just for a matter of time, we're gonna be finishing here. I, I don't wanna miss to thank Dr. Andre Medeiros and Dr. Luz Marina Melo, amazing surgeons helping us to translate, you know, we're in English, Spanish, Portuguese, so many people, you know, uh, watching this and we're very, very happy. Uh, hi to everybody also in YouTube. You know, there's a lot of people asking there in YouTube. Uh, again, you know, we have the fake commenters community, an amazing group always discuss discussing about these amazing things. And we have also courses for you guys. Dr. Perez was telling us about, you know, how, how can I start, uh, you know, doing surgery? Well, 
in, in, in that you know QR you can you know learn more about what we're doing I want to thank you so much we're gonna also invite you to next Wednesday to learn fake or fast and efficiently I think we're gonna have a great time we're gonna talk a lot about technology how we can improve uh, this adults learning fast okay guys um, again just in the in next week we also are gonna have uh, um, a workshop for 50 people so everybody who wants to be there you know quick picture and we're gonna have a personalized workshop I'm gonna let's stop sharing the screens I want to see all the panel and say hi say bye to everybody Shemaine, uh, you know some last last words we're having a great time here right <laughs> Thank you so much. It was just amazing. Thank you so much, as you mentioned, to the panelists, everybody there at the um, Alcon Experience Center in Mexico. Uh, there's so much going on behind the scenes, and we really want to thank those people, the translators. I love the fact that uh, we have Spanish and Portuguese for everybody because everybody wants to, to learn. And uh, learn FACO fast and efficiently next week, and then we have um, anterior vitrectomy. And I think you and I will cry when the series is over because we've been having so much fun. But um, I know we'll be planning um, more sessions in the future. Okay, guys, so thank you everybody for your time. Thank you all the people that were with us. You know, we, we know the time is precious. So thank the panelists, thank everybody, thank you. My yeah. brother here with me, you know, a great <laughs> surgeon. Thank, thank you for your time. So Bye thank everyone, you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>